Go make sure I'm comfortable. All right, cool. Uh, hey guys, welcome to my third Let's Chat Jurassic Park. Um, I've been really enjoying doing these, so I figured, you know, it's about time that I do another one. I've been doing them actually, I think, pretty much weekly at this rate. I've done each one. So, yeah, I can see we've got quite a few people in the chat already. So there's Heggy says, Bonsoir. Oscar Stanton says, Good evening. And Raptor Dundee says, ah, I made it this time. Uh, hi, guys in the chat. Um, yeah, we've got quite a few subjects to talk about tonight. Uh, Master Builder's just come in, says JP Carnosaur uploaded pictures of all the JP, uh, JW hybrid toy line in box form. I know, I saw um, the Carno Raptor is obviously uh, the one everyone's talking about, so that's the one to look out for. Um, and that's actually one of the first uh, of Hasbro's Jurassic World toys that I might actually buy, you know? Figment of your imagination says yellow. I do. Welcome to the chat. Um, yeah, so let me begin. Uh, so I've got four main subjects for tonight's discussion, uh, which some of them were sent in, um, and some of them were ones that I thought of. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about uh, one of the main things we're going to talk about tonight is the illustrations and conceptual drawings. I'm just looking up on my phone here. Uh, conceptual drawings uh, of the Lost World. And I've got it loaded up on the DVD. As you can see in the background, uh, you've got that wonderful piece of artwork uh, which is seen in the Lost World. Uh, I forget the artist's name, but yeah. The uh, picture in the background was released in full HD. I might have to look that up when we get into it. But you know, we'll go through all the, you know, conceptual drawings and illustrations for the Lost World later on in a, in a few uh, minutes or so. But yeah, so I've got, uh, that's coming up. But what do you guys want me to talk about first? Is there any subjects that you guys would like me to chat about or chat amongst each other? Uh, any subjects that you'd like to hear talked about first? I can see the Carno Raptors getting a lot of love in the uh, in the chat there. Velociraptor Dundee says, the sad thing is that the Carnoraptor is just the blue figure with a different head and paint job. See, now, I don't have the blue figure, so I I could own that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Jurassic Unicar says, evening gents, a nice pick. Yeah, I wish I'd draw it. I wish I drew that picture, but um, sadly I didn't. <laughs> Mm. By the way, have you listened to the In General Podcast, episode 41 yet? Uh, the Grant, Alan Grant figure is not the final one. Yes, I actually listened to that today. Um, and yeah, it's cool. Uh, it'd be cool to see what the final product's going to look like. Um, I don't have the cash to pick any of them up. Um, but yeah. Talk about what you'd want to happen in Jurassic World 2. Um, okay. Or Jurassic Park 5. Uh, I think I'm pretty much with the rest of you guys. I want to see something that just feels like Jurassic Park. Um, you know, I want to see... I'm, I'm actually glad they're going off island uh, for the most part. It's going to be really cool to see uh, different parts of the world and, you know, see what, uh, what happens there. And, you know, I'm not really bothered about, uh, you know... The cat's just come in. Timmy, stop me meowing, or I'm just going to pour water on you, because you're being really irritating tonight. Um, yeah, so... Right, one second. Timmy, bugger off. Bugger off. <laughs> Cat's come back. Um, yeah, he's really annoyed because we can't let him out because he's my sister's cat and he doesn't know this area at all. And we're worried that if we let him out, he'll get run over or something. So he has to stay in. But 
today I let him out and uh, on a lead we walked him around the garden and now he just won't stop me out at the doors and I knew I was doing this tonight so maybe I'll get him up on the couch with love and uh, you know <laughs> don't be mean to Timmy um, yeah anyway Jurassic World 2 I'm just excited that they're, they're, there's going to be another film I mean I'm still kind of you know, reeling from the fact that we got a fourth Jurassic Park movie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, be really cool to see a fifth one, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, what, what are you saying about saying? What are your thoughts on it filming in Hawaii and maybe Wales? Wales would be ridiculously cool. I've, I've had family up in Wales and uh, I've been up there a number of times and some of the locations there, I always imagined uh, dinosaurs roaming around that area, so it'd be really cool to see see it actually come to life on the big screen. That'd be awesome. Mm. <clears throat> but yeah, them filming in Hawaii. Um, I think, obviously, you know, the thing that jumps to mind is that you might see the ruins of the old park or of Jurassic World is what I'm saying, like the devastation Jurassic World or Isla Sauna, which is something, you know, I think everyone would welcome. Uh, but I have a feeling, and this is my own uh, take on the, on the situation. I have a feeling that, uh, you know, they could be, there could be some sort of plots uh, taking place in Costa Rica and then they've just filmed in the uh, in the jungles uh, of Hawaii because you know it has the same sort of climate. Because uh, Costa Rica, maybe they can f the filming is more relaxed on Hawaii, so they can get there. But you know, but I think the obvious answer is it's one of the islands. You know, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised. What I'm saying is that if they didn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they were filming in Hawaii to film jungle shots for whatever reason. Uh, Master Builder says, I want a clone of the Indominus Rex to be back uh, because the Indominus was badass. I, I, you know, I, depending on how they would handle bringing back an Indominus Rex, you know, I'd welcome it, but uh, I'm happy with what we've got. So if we don't see the Indominus Rex again, you know, I'm okay. Uh, Michael Farm says, hello, people. Hello, Michael. Or I think it's Michael, isn't it? ML Farm. I think your first name is Michael. A fellow Ray Harryhausen fan. Um, I freaking love Ray Harryhausen. Ah, Sick Trike has come in. Oh, Sicky T says Jurassic Chat. Yo, do. So, yeah, okay, so I've got some subjects tonight. I've got my whiskey. Got some subjects. Um, I've got four subjects here. So, connections to other franchises. Uh, was Muldoon abandoned? The illustration and conceptual drawings of the Lost World, which is what you can see in the background, um, and Udesky's underrated line. Now, what would you guys like me to talk about first out of those four? And while you decide on that, I'll talk about what you guys are asking me in the chat. Sick Trike says, Hey, Jack, have you talked about the Chronicle stuff yet they're working on? I'm really like pleased to see uh, more Jurassic products out there that are like ridiculously high quality. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm not rich, so I'm like a little bit disappointed that you can't just go into any old shop and just buy them, that they're gonna be like special orders or whatever. Um, I feel like that obviously Jurassic fans, we don't get as much stuff at this time. We don't get as much stuff as like a lot of other franchises. So having something that's ridiculously cool, uh, dangled in front of everyone's nose <laughs> for a high price is a bit annoying, but I can understand why the prices are the how, why they are that high. It's because of the manufacturing, the quality, uh, the, the way, the way I listened to the J, uh, the Jurassic Outpost podcast with the guys and I fully understand so I back them completely I think they're really cool if you can afford them and you want them get them uh, you know why not uh, but yeah for me they're just way out of my price range and uh, I think personally like I'm not 
I'm not really like a statue kind of person. I mean, I've got some statues upstairs, uh, but mainly because they fell into my lap for other reasons. Like I've got the Jurassic Park, the T-Rex bursting through the gates, which came with the DVD or the Blu-ray box set. But that's because it came with the Blu-ray box set and I uh, bought that. Um, and the other kind of statues I own are really... Uh, they're not really statues actually, they're like just, well, they're the old Kenneth figures that I have up on the desks and stuff, which is, you know, uh, I just have my like Kenneth stuff out. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'm really a statue kind of person, but I think they look really cool. And uh, I think my favourite out of all of them, I mean, if I was, if I had the money to get one, I would definitely get the Compsognathus. That would be the first one I would get. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay, so we've got a couple of people asking for me to talk about Udesky's underrated line. I can see that being said three times in the in the chat. Okay, so I was watching Jurassic World the other day. Let me let me get this started. So I was watching Jurassic World the other day, and I was, as I've said before in previous uh, live chats, that. You know, I'm not watching the first film until I go to the Royal Albert Hall later in November. And so I've been watching the sequels and connecting how they and looking at how they kind of all connect. And <clears throat> Jurassic Park 3 has been, since Jurassic World's come out, looking back at Jurassic Park 3 retrospectively, um, it actually, you know, Jurassic World has helped Jurassic Park 3 become quite a really a, a crucial chapter in the franchise. And by that, I mean subtly crucial. Obviously, when they were making Jurassic Park 3, they didn't think to uh, what Jurassic World was, but it kind of fits. So, like, for one example, like when, you know, Grant says, I don't remember that being on InGen's list. Uh, obviously, he's talking about the Spinosaurus, and you don't know why that's uh, on InGen's list. And when he says, makes me wonder what else they're up to, obviously, you can connect the dots, and Jurassic World is what they were up to, because... InGen is still going, uh, you know, in that movie and on Isla Nublar, the park is there. And uh, I had this whole conversation with uh, Jack de la Mer and Jurassic Collectibles on Twitter. We were talking about uh, Hammond's line where he's talking about, uh, or Masrani's line, sorry, where he says about Hammond's dying wish. Uh, it was to have the park open and that brings up lots of speculation as to what was actually happening on Isla Nublar uh, between, you know, the years. And obviously in The Lost World, uh, as Neelius put in his uh, uh, blog, which I think he posted out on JurassicRaptor.com, he pointed out that, you know, obviously the deleted scene from The Lost World talks about them bombing Nublar and all this sort of stuff, but then they removed that from the film. But when you watch The Lost World, obviously they're talking about, uh, you know, they talk about Nublar as if it doesn't even exist, um, which is, you know, fair enough because the movie doesn't take place on there and stuff. So, but Udesky's line is what I'm getting to. So the interesting part about Ude this line from Udesky, which I'll, re which I'll say in a minute, is it basically means that Isla Nublar is very, very secretive. Um, you guys are saying you can't really hear me. Uh, let's have a look. Can you guys hear me now? I should be coming through louder now. Um, yeah, so... Can you guys hear me fine now? Let's see. I'm going to have another sip of whiskey while I wait for their replies. Mm. But yeah, so Udesky's important line is this. He says... So there is another island with dinosaurs on. Uh, he's basically talking about Isla Nublar. He doesn't. He doesn't realise that um, uh, that Isla Nublar exists. Timmy, hey, come here. Come here. I'm gonna be nice to you. But you've gotta stop me, Aaron. Do you wanna come say hi to the people in the Jurassic chat? Come here. I realised I was waffling on and you guys probably couldn't even hear me. <laughs> Come here. Come on. 
Oh, oi. Tim. Come up here. Come on, you annoying cat. Come here. There he is. Come on. Um, yes, so Udesky, when he says, when uh, Paul Kirby says, like, you know, well, Alan Grant says, I've never been on this island. And then he's like, sure you have. You wrote that book. Um, and then he's like, Billy says, that was Isla Nublar. This is Isla Sauna, site B. Uh, clearly, Billy knew about Isla Nublar more because of Alan Grant. Um, but Udesky saying, so there's another island with two dinosaurs on them. Yeah, uh, Jurassic Unicast has got it basically means that not everyone in the world up until 2001 is to still totally convinced about, uh, you know, the Jurassic Park incident. Obviously, Isla Sauna is well known and documented because of the San Diego incident. But, uh, but Isla Nublar might actually be uh, still looked at as a mystery uh, for the most part. And I really like that because in the whole sort of world building of the series so far obviously between Jurassic Park and Jurassic World Isla Nublar you don't really see it you only hear about it so the mystery of like the park being built on Isla Nublar is sort of enhanced when you watch Jurassic Park 3 and you know there's InGen's list and you don't know all this you know there's all this stuff going on behind closed doors and then even people out in the world say things like you know so there's two islands with dinosaurs on like some people still don't know, which I thought was really interesting. And I figured that that's a really important line said by Udesky, which often gets overlooked that people out in the world of uh, the Jurassic universe, you know, they don't, uh, they don't actually know that there's actually two islands. They only think there's one. So there you go. That's Udesky's important line. I hope that makes sense. Um, sorry about the sound, uh, sound being so low. I turned it down because uh, it was really loud the other night. Uh, what we got here? Mm. Oscar Sant says it also alludes to the fact that there are dinosaurs running wild on Isla Nubla that hasn't been bombed. Well, I've, I don't think Isla Nubla was ever bombed. Uh, reasons for this are uh, you know, as follows. One, the T-Rex is still alive in uh, Jurassic World. Two, the visitor center is still standing in Jurassic World. Three, I don't think all the dinosaurs were killed. Um, I don't think the T-Rex was the only one to live. I think others were uh, survived. Obviously, the Masrani site that me and Tim wrote, we allude to the dinosaurs still being alive for the most part. Um, you know, whether you want to take that as canon or not, that's up to you. We don't care. That's our canon. <laughs> um, so we like to think, yeah, the dinosaurs did survive. They just rounded them up and did other things. Um, but, you know, the future films could, could rewrite that. Um, Mr. Creepercraft says, I've seen the first three movies, but when I was younger, I need to go rewatch them. Yeah, man, they're really good. Go watch them all the time, all the time. Uh, Sick Truck says, cool. Michael Farm says, that makes sense. He's trying to suggest, agree, I was trying to suggest that based on Udesky's line, the island wasn't destroyed. Yeah, and it's a, it's funny because, like, obviously Malcolm is the first to break his NDA about what happened on the island, uh, which is mentioned at the beginning of The Lost World. Uh, Grant, obviously after the San Diego incident, everyone knows about Jurassic Park because, you know, the... Uh, the what was I saying? The the whole what's the word I'm looking for? Lecture room when he's like, does anyone have a question that doesn't relate to Jurassic Park? Everyone's got their hands up, so they all know about Jurassic Park. But um, <clears throat> when Udesky says, so there are two islands with dinosaurs on, like he doesn't know about Isla Nublar, so it's still quite a I like to think of it as a almost like an Area 51 type scenario. So obviously people know uh, Grant went to Area 51. They don't know if it was real and all this sort of stuff. So uh, 
that alludes to the fact that Isla Nublar is very much on lockdown between Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Uh, secrets are still going on on there, and obviously when we get to Jurassic World, you see what has been happening on there, and what has been happening since 1997 is, you know, they've been building the park and, and doing all that sort of stuff. Hmm. Miss Creepercrafter said, did anyone else know that the T-Rex in Jurassic Park 3 was the baby in Jurassic Park 2? Steven Spielberg said it. So, really? When did he say that? If he, if Spielberg said that, that would be hilarious, but really sad. I, I've never, when I was younger, I liked to think that that was the same one, but uh, no. That baby broke its leg, survived, killed a human. It, 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 it would put up more of a fight than the T-Rex did in Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> and Jurassic Unicast says, well, the deleted scene in The Lost World was about the bombing. In hindsight, glad they didn't. Or we wouldn't have seen the full, fully functioning park. Exactly. And Velociraptor Dundee says, I'm 99% sure that Stan Winston Studios debunked that the baby... Uh, was the one in Jurassic Park 3 on their Jurassic Party. Yeah, yeah, I think I've heard that. I mean, there's a fan theory that has been going around ever since the third film came out. Um, but yeah, I used to think it, but now I'm just like, no. And I think the coloration's different as well. The baby T-Rex in Lost World is like a purpley, yellowy brown, whereas the one in Jurassic Park 3 is fully green. Come on, Timmy. So yeah, um, what was I going to say? So Udesky's underrated line, just to finalise, it just it just dawned on me that like he's one of the some of, he's an example of someone who doesn't really know the full story. So uh, he's a new blood. Is still a mystery for a lot of people. Can you come here. <laughs> All right, so. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Uh, or do you want to go on to uh, the three other subjects we've got tonight, on which I've listed? Uh, the illustrations and conceptual drawings of The Lost World, which is uh, what I've got playing in the background. Um, we can go through all those and just talk about them. Uh, was Muldoon abandoned? Uh, connections to other franchises. I see some more people have arrived in the chat. I think it was Stuart the Sock. Let me just explain you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Stuart the Sock uh, gave me the Muldoon thing and Diego Rossi brought me the connection to other franchises subject to talk about. Uh, so what would you guys uh, talk about the Spinosaurus? It says Master Builder. Concept Arts is uh, firm. Talk about the Spinosaurus. What would you want me to talk about the Spinosaurus? Uh, connections, okay, some people want different things. Connections to other franchises. Concept Art and talk about the Spinosaurus. Uh, do you think Delta survived? Um, at this moment, no. Delta was thrown onto a barbecue and cooked alive. I don't think she's alive. I will accept it if they bring her back and she's all like scarred um, and somehow <laughs> rolled off the thing. Okay, everyone's talking about Muldoon. Let me let me explain this. Was Muldoon abandoned uh, thing? So. Uh, Stuart the Sock, I have to say thank you to Stuart the Sock who brought this up. Um, okay, was Muldoon abandoned? He brought this to light to me the other day and it had me in stitches. Uh, essentially, um, Muldoon, obviously we all know Muldoon gets eaten by a raptor and gets killed. Uh, we all know that. Uh, the whole clever girl scene. It's one of the most iconic scenes in the franchise. We, in the franchise, we know Muldoon is dead. However, um, Alan... Ellie, John, and Ian, and the kids don't. Unless, well, it's never shown that they know that he's dead. 
So when they leave the visitor centre and Grant's like, uh, I've decided to not endorse your park, and then Hammond says, so am I. Like, they just go to the helicopter and leave. No one goes, wait, where's Muldoon? <laughs> just leave the island. So essentially Muldoon in some ways could be looked at. He was abandoned by those other people to just fend for himself. I said that I assumed Ellie found him um, and she told them what she found when she got back to the uh, uh, visitor center. But uh, I've heard a lot of people, uh, you know, say about Zara in Jurassic World, they made a big point about Zara dying and then no character talks about Zara afterwards. Well, the same can be said to Muldoon. Because <laughs> essentially, we never see that Muldoon was talked about. We assume it was off camera. But if we go by what we see on screen, everyone just packs their bags and gets off that island without even like asking, where the hell's Muldoon? Like, <laughs> you know, they just leave him on the island. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, Delta is now the Freddy Krueger of Jurassic World, says Michael Farm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, imagine that if she had, like, a really, like, messed up claw hand as well. <laughs> Lol, those assholes. Luke Hornsey says, well, everyone was abandoned according to the JP game. Um, what do you, what do you mean by that? Because I, I've played a little bit of the JP game, but what did they say that like Alan and Ellie and everyone was abandoned? Uh, okay. Master Buzz says, talk about the Spinosaurus. Why the Spinosaurus in JP3? Uh, and it was Echo it thrown into the grill, not Delta. Delta was chomped and thrown. Really, I always thought it was the other way around. Uh, on the Blu-ray, it looks pretty clear because Echo has the strike. Well, I've said this before. It really doesn't matter because they're both dead. <laughs> you know. See, everyone's talking about Echo and Delta, which one? At the moment, unless the next film brings one of them back, uh, at the moment they're considered dead. So it really doesn't matter who died first. They're both they're both dead. Um, Luke Hornsey says, the dress by game, they said the guests were taken off the island and the rest left. And they left the rest. Yeah, see, that's an inconsistency because there was no one else... Oh, so they were talking about Muldoon. But no, there wasn't anyone else on the island. There was only that small group that we see in the movie. Because everyone else, after Nedry, the boat Nedry was trying to get was literally the last boat. I think. And bear in mind, I'm drinking whiskey tonight, so my memory might be a bit more skewed. Hmm. <laughs> People say that if you turn the volume really loud, when Blue runs off, she's running towards another raptor's call. See, that's interesting because I've always thought that that was Blue calling out to the to the pack. I assumed that like she got knocked out, and while she was knocked out, all the other raptors, or Delta and Echo, were killed, and Blue waked up, woke up, ran straight towards the Indominus had the fight, and then when she, you know, left after the Indominus was dead, she was running back towards where she last saw her pack and was just calling out for them. In the game, there were staff members that were left behind. Oh, okay, see, you know, yeah, I've never really got into that game. Um... I know they made it to say it was a, a canological tie-in with the movie, but it's not It's not in my canon at all. Um, 
Luke asks, what is your opinion on the new film being filmed in the UK? R extremely happy. That's all I'm going to say. For years I've been, ever since I was a kid, watching these movies and going, oh, it's so mystical, the idea of Jurassic Park being filmed in Hawaii, which is almost exactly on the opposite side of the world to where I am right now. And now the next film should be filming in the very country that I'm in, which is awesome. You know, it'd be really, really cool to see uh, UK become uh, Jurassic crazy. But that's mainly because, uh, you know, the UK is, you know, like China, become a pretty big player in the Hollywood market recently. So, um, you know, why not? Anyway, right, so we've talked about Muldoon's abandonment. <laughs> I don't think Muldoon was abandoned. I think Ellie told them when she got back to the visitor centre. Uh, Udesky's underrated line, we've covered that. Uh, now we have connections to other franchises and uh, illustrations and conceptual drawings of the Lost World. Which one would you like me to talk about first? Would you like me to talk about the illustrations? And go through those, or would you like me to talk about connections to other franchises? Um, what are you guys saying? You should really. Sick Truck says you should be invited to visit the set or something. Dude, I think you should be visited, uh, invited to go visit the set. We're all in the UK. Stuff in Nonsense says, I really like the story of the JP game. Would like to see a comic version of it with the new IDW ones. Really hope they're better than the last slot. Yeah, I'm really happy that IDW have the have the license. Uh, really cool. Can't wait to see what they come up with. Um, I would love to get my hands on writing stories for that. That would be so kick-ass. Uh, especially if they did like between Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Um, you know, with the Masrani Global stuff, there's definitely some stories to tell there. Um, but the chat's going by so fast. Are you happy Hasbro is losing the right to make Jurassic World toys? Speaking of that, I just got a fully working Red Rex for $60. And concept that bloody hell, lucky you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not happy that Hasbro's Hasbro's lost the license because you know it's sad whenever someone loses an awesome license. But I feel like that uh, it, I get the sense that it was a mutual handover. It wasn't like Hasbro were clawing onto the license while Mattel ripped it from their hands. I think it was like a yeah. Let's uh, pass it on, you know. Uh, which is better, The Lost World novel or movie? Has to be movie for me. I love the novel, don't get me wrong, absolutely love the modern novel. You can't really compare the two uh, because they're two different things. A novel does very different things to what a movie does. But in terms of uh, entertainment value, for me, it's The Lost World movie over the book because the movie I can get done in two hours <laughs> and have a roaring good time pun not intended Jurassic Raptor says what up peeps what up Justin glad you're here would you like a sip of whiskey for this Jurassic chat mm. yeah uh, I can see Master Builder's talking about when Blue turns at the end of the film, is she running towards another raptor? It's speculative, and I think that Trevorrow uh, made it purposefully that way uh, to keep open doors. And But like I said, until we see one of the other raptors alive in the next film, to me, they're dead. They're, they're dead. Blue, Echo and Delta, they're gone until the films prove me otherwise. Uh, <laughs> Jurassic Raptors has had my fill of whiskey sours last night. <laughs> uh, uh, 
Luke Hornsey says, I don't know why, but I feel like my personality mirrors Richard Levine's for some reason. <laughs> All right, guys, what do you want me to talk about? Do you want me to talk about the illustrations and conceptual drawings from The Lost World or connections to other franchises? We've covered Udesky's underrated line and Was Muldoon Abandoned? Um, for those of you who have just joined, you might need to watch this back when I upload it to hear about those, but uh, Udesky's underrated line, just to cover it briefly again, is uh, when he says, so there are two islands with dinosaurs on? He basically prove, is, is proof that not everyone in the world knows about both islands. Don't, they don't know all the facts. Uh, we've got two votes now for the illustrations. Yeah, okay, everyone's everyone's saying concept art. Alright, let me, uh, before I get onto this concept art quickly, I just have to look up who the artist was for uh, <laughs> this, what's showing in the background, because I know there was a uh, Jimmy Catranis? Jimmy Catranis, is that right? Because there's the full version that was uploaded online. I don't know if you guys can see that uh, very well. It might be reflecting in my thing. But yeah, apparently he uh, drew the original of this and uploaded it in you know full glorious HD on on the internet the other night, which was really cool to see. Um, but yeah, so this drawing in the background is obviously something that you see in the Lost World and. I remember when I was a kid and, uh, you know, Nick Van Owen, uh, you know, gets spooked by the jaws of the T-Rex, uh, that when it pulled out, you know, that was so nostalgic, even though I was eight when The Lost World came out and I saw Jurassic Park when I was four, it was, uh, it was fantastic. Um, if you, Mr. Creeper Crafter, the image I was talking about is the one that's in the background, uh, the T-Rex with the gates, the one that's on the image right now. Um, yeah, it's like, I remember that being like really nostalgic, even though it was a couple of years after the first, or well, four years after the first film. It was like, oh my God, yeah, Jurassic Park, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I think that like, if you watch the scene where Nick Van Owen, you know, bumps into this picture and turns around and looks at it and then look at the scene when uh, Zach and Gray go into the visitor center uh, you know and they're looking at the old Jurassic Park stuff though those scenes I really feel like are quite similar even though different plot points are happening there uh, they feel quite similar you know discovering the old Jurassic Park um, yeah it's really cool Love the music cue when he sees that, yeah. And Michael Farm says, I do like how it mirrors the wall art you see in JP, but I admit it feels off. What what make what feels off? The what seeing this artwork on Isla Sauna or Hmm. What feels off about it? But yeah, really cool. Um you can you can tell, and this is a kind of uh, my own take on this, uh, you can tell that the artist who drew this may have had insight to <clears throat> the world building of the first film that, uh, well no, not, not really, wait, let me, let me get this right. This image here is what John Hammond envisioned for Jurassic Park if it was open. So aside from Jurassic World, um, aside from Jurassic World, this is as close as we're going to get to seeing what the original Jurassic Park would look like if it was open. And by that I mean there's three T-Rexes, there's Pteranodons, and there's, you know, multiple tour cars it's seen in the picture. And I like to feel this was a mural that was on Isla Sauna to sort of uh, be a, hey, this is where we're going to, this is the goal that we're trying to get to, this is the open park. 
Jurassic Raptor says, there's a night variant too with headlights and fence lights glowing. Dude, I've never seen that. Do you have a link? Post it in the in the chat or on Twitter if you have a link to that. I've never seen it, unless it's on this, <laughs> and I just can't remember it. All right. All right, let's go to the next image. Let's do this. Let's go through the concept art of the Lost World. Hopefully the, uh, the thing moves, all right. Oh, here you go, like, it zooms in. So this, uh, you know, has, I'm using the Lost World DVD, which, uh, where have I got it? I'm using this one, so it's the shiny one. So I can use the, the DVD to get all these illustrations up. Jurassic World was Masrani's vision. This illustration is Hammond's original dream. Yeah, that's what Oscar, Oscar Stanton just said that. And yes, I agree. Um, I have to admit, personally, uh, Hammond's dream is very beautiful and uh, obviously uh, very nostalgic. I think in terms of actual physically working theme parks, I think Masrani's worked obviously it was open for 10 years but I mean like in terms of you know Hammond's had loads of problems they didn't want to put locking mechanisms on the vehicle doors uh, you know they, they didn't have they only had electric fences to keep the dinosaurs at bay um, whereas like the T-Rex in Jurassic World was walled in <laughs> you know there was a, there was a lot going yeah, as a park, Jurassic Park was a massive flaw, would never work. That's what um, uh, Jurassic Unicast just said. And Stuff in Nonsense has a link to the night version, which I'm just going to quickly look up now. Oh, okay, yeah, no, I have seen that. Was that actually an official version, or was that a fan edit? Because to me, that kind of looks like a fan edit. But anyway... Here we can see the raptors looking uh, kick-ass. And you can see there's no males there, which was a nice touch. I'm glad they didn't uh, put any male raptors on there. And then you can see what almost looks like Lex and Tim uh, pointing out the windows of the vehicles there. Hmm. And if you notice the uh, <clears throat> the logo on the on the car behind it is a really really rough version. <laughs> uh, James, I'll post the link to it uh, after the chat's done, so you can see you've definitely seen it before. Um, but I don't know if uh, if it's an official one. Now that is kick-ass. That is pretty cool. I might have to get cut that out and like trim that out and use it in something, uh, like a video. Maybe put it in the corner of the next Jurassic chat or something. That's pretty cool. Now here we go. We're on to some of the conceptual drawings. Uh, this scene, I have no idea where this was meant to be. Maybe this was... Uh, originally going to be when Nick Van Owen was going to turn the power on. Um, but you can quite clearly see water, uh, you know, on, on, they're standing in like a flooded area, but it's inside a facility. It almost looks like a, a, a setting you would see in one of the Alien movies. Um, but yeah, I don't quite know the history behind this. If anyone in the chat has... Uh, more information on this you'll have to let me know uh, let me let me see about something I'm just going to see if I can up the uh, 
just going to up the brightness a little bit so you guys can see better. That should be better for you guys, right? Okay, yeah, this was... Michael Farn says, yeah, this was supposed to be the complex Nick went into. Okay, yeah, see, I assume that uh, that was the case. Um, hopefully, I'm just checking on the chat. Yeah, I up the brightness a little bit so you guys can see. Um, but yeah, this uh, the, the design of the building that he's in there, or this concept piece, really reminds me of Alien. And uh, this actually reminds me of, like... Uh, well, when I was a kid, this is how I envisioned the scene where Muldoon is fighting the raptors in the visitor center from the first book. But you'd have to be in my own head to uh, to fully appreciate that. This image is one of the coolest from the Lost Worlds concepts, uh, in my opinion. I remember when I first got the... Uh, the making of the Lost World book by Jody Duncan, and uh, you know, opened it up, and this was one of the first images I saw, and I thought this was so kick-ass that uh, you know, I thought, Im imagine seeing this on screen one day, like a T-Rex's lair, you know, it goes into a cave, and uh, you know, it's just eating something, but I was always a a tiny bit confused by uh, I've been a tiny bit confused because like is that dinosaur that's lying up on the hill is that dead or is it alive and I want you guys in the chat to try and to uh, like convince me of what the answer is because I've never known the answer to this like when I was a kid I've studied this picture and I've tried to work out, is that dinosaur lying on its side on the hill, dead, or is that alive? Because <laughs> I have no idea. Let's just have a little look, see what we've got going on here. Yeah, it seems to be getting all right. It's the baby T-Rex. says Jurassic Raptor. Yeah, okay, I can believe that. It just doesn't really look like a T-Rex to me. It's got like a more pointy face. To me, it looks kind of like a raptor. Yeah, you're right. It couldn't be dead because it's raising its head, says Luke. <laughs> well when I was a kid I was looking at this for ages I just had no idea what was going on with that thing on the hill whether it was a, the baby or whether it was dead or whether it was <laughs> alive I didn't know so yeah Oscar Stanton says I think it's a raptor cowering in fear but I have no idea anyway we'll move on from this I think that's really cool is a some concept or looks even more like a storyboard from the T-Rex breakout in San Diego which is a really cool shot because it's a, with the white rim around all this it like kind of looks almost like a symbol like you could uh, have this as a sticker that you could put on something And for every, anyone who says, like, you know, Steven Spielberg tacked on the, the San Diego incident onto the end of The Lost World, he didn't. It was, was planned well into production. It was just, it was changed, uh, you know, late into production, but it still had time for all these storyboards to come about and for them to plan filming and, and lay the groundwork for it in the plot while filming and stuff. Hmm. Right, I'm just going to pour myself another whiskey while you guys are, while the stream catches up. <laughs> whiskey is essential. 
looks like a Riccardio Delgo piece. Delgadio. This picture's awesome. So you've got, uh, you know, the male T-Rex, I'm assuming, with the female in the background, overlooking Isla Sauna. And the T-Rex closest to us, the one in the foreground, really looks like the one from Jurassic Park 3, uh, doesn't it, for the most part, with its uh, green coloration and, and everything. But I really like this image. It's one that um, I think is actually quite an underrated uh, Jurassic Park image. Uh, I think I might actually have to do something with this, find a high quality uh High quality image. Sick Trike says this looks like some of your work. <laughs> I wish this was some of my work. Um, really cool. It's a little bit more cartoony than what I would like to do, uh, but I can see where you're coming from. Why does everything have blood in the river? Oh, it doesn't have blood in the river. It's because uh, the trees I've got on my stream, I've got a picture of the Jurassic Park tree line at the bottom, and uh, and I've got red hue over it. So in the actual image, it's not blood at all. It's uh, it's 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 blue. It's just the image I've got behind the raptor head at the bottom of this stream. At the bottom is uh, is red. Yes, I can see the baby T-Rex in this one. This image is awesome. And Jurassic Raptor just said, I like the San Diego en ending, but I wish they hadn't gutted so much of the work of village and raptor stuff for it. Well, as you said that, I put this image on, and yeah, look at this. The work of village where they get attacked by Pteranodons would have been awesome. Would have been so, so freaking cool. Like a lot of this stuff that we're going to see in these in these images are just so cool. Uh, you know, some really interesting stuff. Like this guy getting whipped off the roof. <laughs> but yeah, this is such a cool image. Hmm. Very, very uh, sinister. The rain makes it as well. Now, this is one of the most famous pieces of concept art from The Lost World, and obviously, uh, this has inspired the death of Masrani. Uh, I think, obviously, when they planned to film this in The Lost World, it went very far into production before it was scrapped. And uh, obviously when all the background stuff of this came out, a lot of fans said, oh, we'd love to see this finally make it onto screens. And uh, yeah, they brought this finally to life in Jurassic World. And as Jurassic Raptor just said, uh, one of the cool things about Jurassic World is they brought some of these scrapped scenes to the screen in a way. Exactly, and that's what I liked. It was like, if you can't, you know, if they did it smart, I think they did it, you know, uh, in a very clever way, because it all ties in together. You know, you have the pteranodons attack the helicopter. The helicopter breaks the aviary. The aviary, the uh, uh, pteranodons fly out and attack the people on Main Street. And oh, just while we're on this point. Uh, I have a theory that the pteranodons attack the people on Main Street because they're obviously extremely hungry. And the reasoning behind this is because I've heard a lot of people say that the pteranodons act like monsters. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think they're extremely hungry because they're more sea bound flying reptiles. As we see, they clearly dive under the water and seem at home at diving under the water to try and get Zara. 
Um, and the Avery is almost smack bang in the middle of the island, nowhere near water. So I've always assumed that when they break out, they flock to the nearest food source, which obviously is this big crowd of people just waiting uh, around for nothing. Um, or they flock to the nearest water source, which happens to be the uh, the Mosasaurus Lagoon, which is right next to Main Street. And they have easy pickings right there. Um, I have a feeling that they underestimated, you know, the Pteranodon's habitat, where they needed to live. And I think the evidence for that is them diving underwater and looking way more streamlined to dive underwater compared to other Pteranodons we'd seen in the franchise. Obviously, we haven't seen anything really to do with the Lost World Pteranodons uh, that we see at the end of the Lost World. Uh, the Jurassic Park 3 ones don't dive underwater because we know that because the one, you know, awkwardly flaps before the cage hits it right on the head. Uh, the ones in Jurassic World are kind of smaller-ish um, and they dive underwater very, you know, well, they dive underwater perfectly. <laughs> we wouldn't be a prey source. What, what do you mean by that? I always found pteranodons killing humans odd. Well, it depends on, you know, what they would do with us. They, they wouldn't obviously swallow us whole, but would they take us back and, you know, rip chunks off us and eat us? I mean, these are fictional animals we're talking about, so... Hmm. All right, enough about Jurassic World. Let's get back to this. This is awesome. Obviously, more artwork of the uh, the T Rex uh, breaking out in San Diego. And I always find it interesting that um, you know when someone's commissioned to paint a piece of concept art for a movie like this that they decide to uh, embellish the T-Rex more. And by that I mean, if you just look at that T-Rex, that doesn't really look too much like a Jurassic Park T-Rex. It's still really, really cool. But it just makes me interested that, you know, interesting to think that they, you know, decided to draw their own dinosaur rather than actually make that T-Rex look like the one from the movie. I mean, it has some striking similarities, uh, you know, with the tiny head crest and a little bump on the nose. But for the most part, that looks uh, almost like an Albertosaurus from the Jurassic Park Operation Genesis game. Um, it's just interesting to me that they decided to draw the T-Rex that way. That's such a cool image, though. That I love the lighting, the lens flare from the lights in the background and the two people looking shocked and running. Such a cool image. All right, the next one. Again, someone looking shocked as the T-Rex uh, walks off the boat. And this is a really thin piece. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this properly in the chat, but there's uh, the T-Rex is walking out the front of the boat. Oh, there you go. That's what it looks like up close. So the T-Rex is walking out of the front of the boat, roaring. Velociraptor Dundee says, all of this art makes me want to draw something again. Yeah, it's getting me in the mood to draw. I've got this, uh, another Jurassic related piece of art that I've been planning on drawing for quite a while now, which I might actually start on soon. Um, just waiting for the right time when I'm in the right mood. Woo. Cool. Excuse me. And there's the guy looking shocked. So much detail in these images. You see his name down the bottom there, James Oxford. I don't know if you're going to see that in the chat because I think the raptor's head's going to be over it. But it says James Oxford in the corner. Oh wow, look at this. This image looks half finished, or maybe it was finished, but looks like someone, I'm gonna try and determine what's happening here. 
Looks like someone's jumping to escape a T-Rex as it smashes through some trees. That's what it looks like. But I'm not entirely sure. It's freaking cool though. Really cool. Jack de la Mer is still live. Hey, yo dude. We're just going through uh, some of the Lost World concept art at the moment. I've only been streaming for an hour, so maybe if the whiskey doesn't destroy me, uh, we'll keep going. <laughs> mm. It does look like a half-finished storyboard. Yeah, maybe from the campsite scene. It looks pretty cool. Do you think that's meant to be Nick Van Owen or, or uh, Ian Malcolm diving... Um, I don't know if this is Crash McCreary. It might be someone else. Uh, there's a name in the corner. What does it say? It says something down there. Last God 95? Is that what that says? <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, wow. Yeah, look. The T-Rex. It looks like someone's jumping across like a gorge and the T-Rex is jumping towards them. Maybe this was from the uh, uh, scene where, you know, they were going to be jumping up to escape the T-Rexes in the high hide. Um, oh yeah, Jurassic Raptor just said, is someone falling from the high hide? Yeah, maybe it's that, because I remember in the Jodie Duncan book, there was the this really cool artwork of the T-Rexes biting at someone trying to get into the high hide. Which I uh, which I really loved, and I always wanted to see. That might actually come up in this. These all look like the same sort of images, actually. So there's the T Rex smashing through some uh, some more branches, and someone you can just see someone to the left uh, hiding. Okay, yeah, they're hiding behind a tree. So maybe this was after the campsite sequence. That's a pretty cool image, this one here. And then you got the, these two, uh, I'm gonna sh assume InGen workers who are looking at some pteranodons flying. Now, whether this was from the scene where they jump off the cliff or whether this was just after the worker village scene where they were gonna be attacked by pteranodons, I don't know, but some of these artwork, some of this artwork just looks so freaking cool. Joshua Lee T says the go this gorge scene should be in uh, the next film. Yeah, that would be so cool. Imagine if it was in Wales. Hmm. 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 Maybe if it was in Wales. <laughs> okay, everyone has seen this before. The raptors all watching the uh, engine hunters going through the long grass. It's a really, really cool image. I love the, the lighting of the moon. However, I have to say I've always found it funny in this piece of artwork, the, <laughs> the way the raptors look all looking out of the grass. Like they're just these little heads sticking out of the grass. It's so funny. It's like, if they're ambush predators, would they just stick their heads up out of the uh, out of the grass and make themselves known, or would they be more like crocodiles? Because, like personally, if I like this artwork's fantastic, don't get me wrong, but if I was to paint this, I would have made the raptors' heads slightly lower so they're more like crocodiles in the long grass rather than just have their whole heads poking up. Don't go into the long grass. Man into the long grass. <laughs> All right, what we got next? See, there you go. Look. This is what I'm talking about. If I was to edit this, I would have made it so their heads were slightly lower. But that's just me. I think this is such a cool image regardless. Um, you got the close-up there of all the raptors. 
And the lighting is so good. The coloration on those raptors looks so kick-ass. This sequence is this well. The sequence, this uh, painting is awesome, and another one where uh, I'm very fond of this image, mainly because of the Jodie Duncan making off book. Because uh, I remember when I first got that, I opened it up, and the first like 10, 15 pages was just full of concept art like this, and I was just blown away by what I was looking at, and uh, yeah, really, really cool. I might just see if I can again just, just up the brightness just a tad for you guys. Just let me know if the brightness goes up. Um, if the brightness goes up, so you guys can see a little bit better. Cause some of these art, some of this artwork is quite dark. Um, it's going to sound really specific, uh, but what I really, really love about this picture is uh, the just to the right of the what I'm assuming is the workers' village. There's this huge overhang of trees, like it's the tallest thing. Like if I'm, let me try and work this out on the on the chat screen. It's like here. I should be pointing at it right here. Uh, this tall gorge thing right here. I think that's so cool because it's such an overbearing, uh, weird looking, uh, I know this side, here you go, here you go, I've got this right, this side, right down here, this tall gorge looking thing is so strikingly weird that uh, is so freaking cool, but you know, it almost looks like something off Skull Island. It doesn't look like it should be in a Jurassic Park movie or anything, but it's such a cool, uh, such a cool image. Jurassic Raptor says, "I love the moody feel of this pitch, feel of this pick." Me too. And Jack De La Mare says, "I've never seen this before. Looks awesome, ha dude. It's in the Jodie Duncan uh, book, uh, The Making of the Lost World, and." Uh, and I'm using this DVD, as I've shown the others, I'm using this DVD to look at all these. So it's, it's in the extras, in the storyboards and stuff. Okay, this is awesome. And part of me, whenever I look at this, I get a little bit sad because... Uh, you kind of get the sense that they were going to film them, you know, airlifting the T-Rex to the SS Ventura. Um, and as a kid, I always assumed that the guy with the two torches uh, waving the helicopter down, because of his hat, I always assumed that was Roland Tembo. <laughs> even though he would not even be there at this time, because, you know, he spent enough time in the company of death. Egypticus says, next level of cool. Oscar Stanton says, this is one of my favourite pieces of artwork. I wish it made it into the movie. That's exactly what I just said. Yes, I agree. This should have been in the film. However, um, seeing imagery like this is not always, you know, ruled out. You know, imagine if in the next Jurassic... Uh, we get a scene where they're like, you know, capturing a T-Rex that's loose in Wales or something stupid like that. And then, you know, there's a scene where they're airlifting it out uh, between the mountains of Wales. And you get, you know, images like this on the screen. That would be pretty cool in my books. <laughs> Luke Hornsey says, out of all the places they could arm the T-Rex, why not the mouth? If he wakes up, he'll eat someone. Yeah, I mean, it's a really cool piece of artwork, but you're right, like, the mouth is fully exposed. There's a... <laughs> you could just turn and snap and eat someone. There you go, look, they're lifting it now into uh, a cargo truck, and its mouth is uh, secured. So there you go. 
See, now what's interesting about this picture is um, that the truck that they're loading it into uh, is actually in the movie. Uh, it's the it's the big uh, you know truck that's on the docks in San Diego, and it's the one that uh, gets knocked onto its side when the boat crashes into the uh, into the dock. And what this storyboard or this concept piece uh, you know is alluding to in my books, it looks like they were going to originally pitch the idea of them actually getting the T Rex to Jurassic Park San Diego before it escaped. Um, that's what it looks like to me because I know this truck is meant to be in San Diego. You can see another car down there. So whether the T-Rex was meant to break out here or, or at Jurassic Park San Diego, uh, it's interesting because obviously this is just a con piece of concept art. So, But whether they actually wrote uh, an idea down for the T-Rex to escape at a different time, uh, I don't know. But the only piece of evidence for that is actually this piece of artwork, I like to think. Joshua Lee T says the art of the tranquilized T-Rex and the lights could be used for Jurassic World sequel if they transport the dinos from Nubla to London. They could use this artwork. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. Like a lot of this imagery could be used in future films. And Jurassic Unicast says Jack de la Mer, great pod with uh, chronic collect chronicle collectibles. Yes, dude, I listened to that today. Fantastic stuff. Um, <laughs> it was really funny actually because my other half. Uh, my fiance, I was telling her all about what Chronicle have been doing uh, and what was seen at San Diego Comic Con this year. But I was trying to look up a video on YouTube to show her uh, the interview that someone did with them. And I was writing in Chronic Collectibles and I was getting all sorts of videos that uh, she was looking at me like, come on, Jack, like Chronic Collectibles? And <laughs> it's Chronicle, not Chronic. You get different type of videos if you look up Chronic. <laughs> uh, Jurassic Raptor says, wasn't there a prototype based on this truck as well? Yes, I think there was. Um, there was a toy as well. There was a Matchbox toy where the T-Rex, uh, you could push the T-Rex forward and uh, it eats a little man with a gun uh, who pokes up. So whether there really was a... Uh, a scene where this truck was driving to Jurassic Park San Diego and then the T-Rex woke up. I mean, admittedly, that would have been kick-ass. See, again, look, it looks like they've got the T-Rex pinned. So I guess this was like early stages. They were talking about, uh, you know, when does the T-Rex attack? Which would have been cool. This is such a surreal image that of two cranes like pinning a T-Rex down. Uh, really uh, strange imagery, but also kind of cool. It's cool in a way because, and I'm going to go really geeky here, and I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, it kind of looks like those two cranes are giant versions of the arm from the first film that picks up the egg that Grant's looking at. You know, the one that holds the baby raptor egg? Kind of looks like they've built these giant cranes to to pin it down. Kind of like that. Use it in that kind of way. I'm not saying they're actually giant arms, but use the cranes kind of like that. Uh, Jurassic Raptors just sent a link in the chat, which I just want to quickly look at. Um, let's have a look. jptoys.com let's have a look I can't, I can't see it for some reason can't see it dude but anyway yeah that's a pretty cool image okay so here we go look if I go back to the last one, you can see that there's they're actually diggers. They're actually diggers uh, that they're using to hold down. Like uh, they've obviously taken the scoops off and and replaced them with holding the T Rex down. 
but you can quite clearly see the caterpillar tracks. Uh, you know, the caterpillar tracks are like down the bottom. But in this one, it's the T-Rex is standing up and it's ripping one of the arms off because down in the bottom left, you can see uh, the caterpillar tracks of one of the tray uh, of one of the trucks. So I'm going to assume that yeah, originally the T-Rex was meant to break out at Jurassic Park San Diego. That's what it looks like to me. I'll get rid of the space. All right, let's have a little look. Let's see. Oh, I see. Yeah, there was a prototype of the truck. Oh, and it's got a Raptor in the back. Yeah, it's kind of similar. That one looks like the trailer's stuck to the truck. But the ones in this uh, concept art um, is the... You see the truck in the film. It's on the docks, and it gets knocked over. And when, like, the guy picks up the gun, he's like, Roland tranquilized it with this. Like, he's saying it right by the truck that was meant to transport it to Jurassic Park San Diego. Anyway, and there we go. Look at that. There is the high hide in between the two tree, these two trees, which is pretty cool. You know, it goes up, goes up high and hide, goes up to where the trees are. You know, it keeps the researchers out of harm's way. You know, puts them at a very convenient uh, biting height. All right. Whiskey's going to me a little bit now. Velociraptor Dundee says it would have been cheesy but also cool if it had have broken out inside Jurassic Park San Diego and the roaring scene was replaced with uh, it roaring while storming through the gates. See, that would have been kick ass. I'm not saying the film is freaking awesome as it is don't get me wrong the lost world is perfect but these storyboards are alluding to the fact that it was originally going to wake up or they were planning to have it done is wake up uh in Jurassic park san diego which would have been cool here's some other uh, concepts of the high hide that one's awesome i love that one like a proper canopy uh, over top that's the one see this one feels to me like if Eddie Carr had more time this is what it would look like and obviously whoever came up with this design uh, whoever came up with this design was obviously basing it on the original visitor center and by that I mean it's got the point with that little bit on top um, whoever designed this was looking at the way they designed stuff in Jurassic Park whereas the one that Eddie Carr has in the movie uh, is more cobbled together you know because obviously they had to get to the island really quickly it was a last minute dash so Eddie just threw together a cube of a cage and and that's it which is really cool and that's why I love The Lost World because it's like you can sense that uh, they're going to the island and they're out of their depth um, and there's, you know, they don't really have much, re many resources. So, you know, I really like this design of the high hide. It would be really cool to see, you know, this in a movie. But this was a concept art before, uh, you know, dare I say it, real thought went into well, what would it actually look like if you had to cobble it together really quickly. <laughs> That's what it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just on a crane, yank it up into the trees. Don't worry about it. It's fine. We're going to be good. And it's funny because in the film, the high hide does work. Hmm. But yeah, I'm just seeing what the chat says. The novel one was an aluminium ball, kind of. Kind of like a gyrosphere up in the trees. In the novel, the high hide was just a hut on stilts. I really like the film, what the film did with it, it made it more interesting. 
like an outdoor elevator. Yeah, I, I like the film version uh, more than the book. Sick Trog said he would camp out in that other high hide. Here we see uh, uh, some of the in-gen hunters. I guess this is when, after the T-Rex attack on the trailers and the camp's been destroyed, they're like, uh, you know, marching through the jungles of uh, Sauna. So pretty simple, you know, uh, piece of concept art, but really cool. You get a sense of the lost world in this one with like the redwood trees. This is them looking down on the uh, on the hunter's camp. Luke Hornsey said, I know I'd probably die, but I would go to Isla Sauna any day. <laughs> I think if I went to Isla Sauna, I'd need a... Uh, I'd need a high hide. Sick Trunk says, the whole, cons the whole scene with... Kelly, Malcolm and Eddie in the high hide is so cool or so good. I agree. I mean, it's one of my favorite scenes of the Lost World, where especially when uh, Malcolm says, you know, uh, we're in a completely different situation right now. And then you hear the T-Rex roar across the island. I think I said that before in a live stream. Like, absolutely love that scene. The novel High Hide had two sections, the hut area and then the caged area. That's awesome. That I had like more than one. One area. This is when the characters are walking by a waterfall. It's almost like a very minimalist looking picture. But you, you can sort of get the gist of what's happening. Uh, and this is the worker village, I'm guessing. So yeah. If you can see here, like the worker village has this bottom area where they enter almost like a couple of gates and then it's actually really long. It's like a western. You know, you've got all the shops going, uh, all the shops and different buildings and stuff going down either side. Excuse me, all the way to the end. It's quite interesting. I was watching The Lost World the other night and I think the raptor sequence in The Lost World, uh, you know, when they're being attacked at the worker village, might be, I don't like to pick favourites, but it might be if I had a gun to my head and someone went, you have to pick your favourite raptor sequence out of the franchise, I think The Worker Village in The Lost World is my favourite. Even though Kelly does kill one of the raptors with gymnastics, I just love uh, when Sarah's jumping across the roof of the buildings and the raptors are following her and uh, they're trying to get into the cars and they're jumping through the windows and they're fighting with each other and they're digging under the doors and I just absolutely love that sequence so much. I love the set. I think it's fantastic. Um, Obviously, no one does have a gun to my head, so I love all the Raptor sequences equally, um, but except for the Alan sequence. But uh, yeah, I think the Lost World one is... I just love the idea of the Raptors jumping across roofs and uh, chasing people across, uh, you know, all that. Here you see some of the... Ingen hunters. I'm assuming they're ingen hunters. They're just sort of indecipherable people uh, walking through the worker village. What looks to be the worker village. Uh, then more shots of the the old village. I think the way they designed it is really cool. It's almost like wooden, but it kind of has this. Uh, it looks like these things were made out of bamboo and but they had power lines so they had telephones uh, and it kind of looks like it was it was actually a small working village and that's what I love about that sequence in the lost world is uh, that it really feels like that they've entered this dead town this once thriving place I mean if anyone ever wanted to do a prequel 
uh, in a movie. I think that is the prequel I would want to see, is them growing, uh, you know, all the untold stories of what happened on Site B before, even before Jurassic Park was uh, built, or while they were building Jurassic Park, let's say, like growing the T-Rex for the first time or growing the raptor for the first time and what happened during the hurricane and uh, you know this that and the other there's so many stories on sauna that it would be really cool to to see and see it in its uh, glory you know working Egyptica says that gymnastic scene was like five seconds of a two-hour movie. It's not that bad. And Jurassic Raptor said, I never minded the gymnastic sequence. It was a good payoff for what seemed like a throwaway line at the beginning. And was a callback to the first movie. Woo! When the day was saved by a kid using her skills. Yeah, I mean, the only reason I didn't like the gymnastic sequence was the kid saying hey you and then the raptor looking at her was i don't know there's just something about that her like a raptor must weigh a lot right a raptor must weigh quite a bit and for her to swing from a pole and kick it it it's just the way the raptor flies through the window it just looks way too light but that's just me like i i don't care i love the lost world so much that you know, there's things about Jurassic Park that I have to overlook, you know, to say I love it and all this sort of stuff. So, uh, but it's just one of those things where you're like, when you say it out loud, a kid kills a raptor by doing gymnastics, you have to kind of take a step back and go, yeah, that is kind of stupid, but it's two seconds long. This, now, sorry, just to change the subject. This is one of the most interesting pieces of artwork that I think is on this uh, section of the DVD. What is this? Like, I think, personally, I think that's where the communications tower is. Because um, Roland Tembo says the communication tower or something, some line like that in the movie. Um, you know, there's some line in the movie where they say the communication tower, I think. So, see you later, Jurassic Unicar. See you later, James. He's now uh, heading off. Um, and I think that literally the communications tower was meant to be a tower. I think. And I think this is it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always felt like this is such a strange piece of uh, uh, artwork because it looks like something out of, uh, you know, Thunderbirds. <laughs> it looks like Captain Scarlet's, like, tower where they do all their communications. But I don't know if any of you guys knew uh, the history behind this art piece of artwork. Like, what was this originally going to be? But I think this is meant to be where Nick communicates with the, the helicopters, with the rescue pie. Hmm. It is communication centre, but I swear someone says tower. I swear a character says tower somewhere. He says operations building. The operations building is right down there at the foot base of these cliffs. How do you know? I've seen it. So communication centre. Communications operations building. I swear someone says tower. I swear. But this in artwork is really cool, regardless. That's your homework for this week, kids. Go and find out. Michael Farm says, maybe the air traffic control tower for the choppers. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, what if it was communications tower in the workers' village? But I, what I'm saying is I'm, I swear someone in the movie says tower somewhere. Like, there's some... Radio tower in the communication center. Yeah, so is that the the tower itself? Okay, so I'm just skipped through to this one. This piece of artwork has always uh, interested me because it's like it just looks like a river of 
skeletons are bursting through uh, a pair of concrete gates in like this giant tunnel. It's a very weird image, uh, but it's always interested me because it just doesn't it doesn't look like something out of a Jurassic Park movie. I'd be interested to see what this would look like on screen, um, what they were intending, the person who painted this, what what they saw in their head. I could be interested to see what, what was actually happening here. Like, was that a place where they just dumped dead dinosaurs to just, like, rot? I have no idea. Yeah, very interesting piece of uh, artwork. There's some more of the worker village there. Very uh, looks like a chapel, almost a church. A um, little bit more fleshed out uh, worker village there. Again, same sort of deal. That's the that's the place where Nick Van Allen goes in. And obviously. Uh, uh, Spielberg really like these ideas because they start to flesh them out a little bit more. Here we see the inside for Jurassic Park San Diego where they keep the baby T-Rex and obviously you can see the cage where the, the big bull T-Rex was meant to go. Luke Hornsey said dead dinosaur compost. Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. That's what it looks like. Looks like it's just like where they just dumped all the bodies. But that would attract all the predators, so would that be a good idea? There's uh, some interesting artwork for in the inside of one of the smashed rotten laboratories. There's a lot of artwork here for the worker village, if you haven't guessed. Uh, <laughs> but it's really cool. It really did flesh out this uh, this area because you know, as uh, as everyone knows, it was originally gonna uh, be in the film a lot more than it was. But it's cool though. It's like uh, you can see in this image here, like to the left, there's that building that really looks like a, a kind of neoclassical building. Uh, that's probably where Hammond stayed. Um, just really cool and obviously in the movie you see that they do have like a petrol station which you can see in this image as well uh, so like I said it would have been really cool here you go there's a close up look the petrol station and the uh, uh, I want to say neoclassical building um, but yeah I'd love to see what this looked like back in its heyday what was going on on sauna some more detailed looks or well, you can even see some people like walking across there Luke Hornsey says Jack will you be going to Comic Con in London this October um yeah I might do uh, I'll see about it uh, I don't know how much the tickets are last time I went there it was because of the podcast we we're going to interview Lego Jurassic uh, World uh, creators so we got a press pass that so we got in for free so I never actually like paid to get in, so I don't know the uh, the ticket pricing. Egypticus says there's heaps of models and maquettes they made of the village too. Yeah, I think there's a whole section on this DVD where you can look at them all. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm just gonna sort of skip through these because there's a lot of worker village ones. This is cool. This is um, the hunter's camp. You can see a stegosaurus and a triceratops and a few of the babies uh, in cages just over in the distance there. And the Humvee is just off to the right. Got some close-ups. There you go. Can you see a baby triceratops, a triceratops adult, a baby stegosaurus, the stegosaurus adult, and a pachycephalosaurus. That's what I can see there. Tickets were like £15 each. They were when I went in May. Yeah, if that's £15, then yeah, definitely I'll go. I'll go again, but I don't. 
depends on what they've got going on, really. Like, maybe if there's something alien going on with Alien Covenant coming out, then, yeah, definitely. Here you can, here you can see definitely the truck at the bottom, uh, which is seen in the film, which is meant to transport the T-Rex. And here comes the SS Ventura. Can you see it on the previous picture? No. Yeah, it smashes in that. So cool. Here we see some uh, helicopter concepts. It's really cool because some of these concept art you don't usually see. Like, there's a lot of artwork with the Jurassic Park franchise that gets thrown about on the internet a lot. And some of the stuff like this image here, you know, if you saw this, you wouldn't necessarily think it was a, a Jurassic Park piece or this, but it is. There's the T-Rex being lifted up by a uh, huge cargo helicopter. It's called the Worker. I think this is meant to be the Hunter's camp uh, on fire. And they obviously put the little tiny dinosaur in, in, the, uh, in the bottom left. And then this is where they're running into the long grass and they're warning them. Don't go into the long grass. Man into the long grass. More of the uh, dinosaur graveyard. And then here we go into Jurassic Park San Diego. There's a lot of artwork on here. Holy crap. This is what we want to get to, right? The vehicles. So uh, this is the motor, well, design for the motorbike that goes underneath the, uh, the um, Machiocamphosaurus. Have I got that right? The really long neck dinosaur in the Lost World. I hope I've pronounced that right. Uh, I know it's got a ridiculously long name. But yeah, it's a pretty cool designed bike. And here we see some of the uh, Mercedes-Benz designs. I really like this one. Uh, I love that cage on the top, and I love the uh, almost... Uh, it's not camo, it's like... I want to say like... Well, not really leopard print either. It's just kind of strange pattern on it. It's really cool, though. And... Uh, it's interesting because it's like... Was, would this be what the cars would eventually look like? If Eddie Carr had more time before going to the islands, is this what the cars would look like? Like in terms of design and uh, and paintwork. Come on, look at that. That looks awesome. Although I'd say the open-topped roof is not a good idea. What really makes you laugh about this one is the, uh, you can see the windows have all these bars, like, perfectly protecting the windows from dinosaurs, but then the windshield and the top is completely exposed. It's a cool, interesting angle at the back. It's nice that you can see the colours they use down in the bottom left. Ah, and that's after the T-Rexes have attacked. So before, after, before, after. <laughs> Poor Eddie Carr. You can see some of the Jeeps. Heggy says, a whole new twist to Meals on Wheels. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie Carr got eaten in a car. Mm. This one's really cool. I like that one. Very simple. It looks like it's pretty much just an engine, some wheels, can of fuel, and a cage. The last one looked a little bit like, you know, a little bit generic, the Jeep. 
this one looks more interesting. There's one of these uh, coming up that they made into the Kenner, uh, the Kenner car, I do believe. Should be coming up in a second, I think. I absolutely love the design of the uh, of the cars in the Lost World. I think they're so kick ass. There, that's the one. That is the one that they actually made into a Kenner uh, vehicle. Now, obviously, they gave these designs to Kenner before the film came out. Uh, you know, so they could go off and make their own ones. But I'm so glad they brought that one to life because I think that one looks so cool. And I think they embellished it a little bit more, uh, made it their own, but. <laughs> Here you can see uh, the design of the car that Dieter Stark and Carter are driving during the uh, the hunters gathering up the dinosaurs, and uh, I really love. I don't know if you're going to see this on the uh, on the on the video, but Dieter Stark's hat is flying off in the background. You can just about see it under Park, uh, where it says Jurassic Park on the side of the. Uh, live stream. There's some more vehicles here. That looks really mean. That looks like it could take some damage and just keep going. Okay, they even better. Okay, so these are the designs for the obviously the hunters' vehicles, and I do like that they made them look more rugged. <laughs> I say that, and then this one comes up. That must be after the uh, the Pachycephalosaurus attack. And obviously got the Humvee. I think this is the one they made into a Kenner toy as well. Oh, oh, Jurassic Raptor. I don't know if you're still watching, but this is the. Uh, the truck that they turned into the toy, the prototype that you sent the image of earlier on in the chat. You sent an image uh, from JP Toys that was of uh, you know this truck. So obviously Kenner got uh, this vehicle in their prototype, and then made, uh, but it never came into uh, fruition. And it looks to me like they're actually capturing a raptor right there. But it looks really cool because it looks like uh, this one looks like they've converted a uh, uh, a garbage truck because you've got those the, the weird arm things towards the cabin. And it looks like, you know, InGen took a garbage truck and said, look, let's let's take out the trash and uh, and uh, capture some dinosaurs. This one's really cool. That's the uh, Unimog, isn't it? Isn't that the uh, Mercedes-Benz Unimog? The scene in Jurassic World. Just a different version. This. This truck they actually did make into a Matchbox toy where the T-Rex is stood in the back and uh, you push the T-Rex forward and a little guy comes up at the front with a gun and the T-Rex chomps down on his head. I used to have one, um, but they got broken. And uh, Matchbox were obviously uh, sent this picture to design their toy, even with the little man sticking out the top. Obviously, they uh, were capturing Pachycephalosauruses, not T Rexes. Some of these vehicles are so freaking cool. Look at that. That's so awesome. Like, these are some of the designs for vehicles I'd love to see in a future film. Like, if dinosaurs are uh, more prevalent around the world, like, it would be cool to see more vehicles like this just being used out out and about. 
obviously this one gets seen in the movie capturing the uh, the Pachycephalosaurus. It's got such, such a massive pair of arms on the front. Here we see the uh, designs for the RV, which I don't know if you guys have been watching. Uh, have you been catching up with the official Auto or the Fish and Auto with uh, their RV restoration? Because it seems to me like they need to get that thing out of the garage they've got it stored in at the moment and go somewhere else. Because it seems like the garage that they're, they've got it in at the moment don't really understand the uh, the awesomeness that they have sitting under their roof. This one here, this more green design, that kind of looks like uh, kind of looks like <laughs> Walter White Breaking Bad goes to Isla Sauna. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Luke Hornsey said they uploaded a new video last week. Yeah, I watched it, and that was the one where they were saying that it's like the, the garage was just like not really doing anything. Like I really, like, I wish I had the cash spare to help those guys. I just don't. But they they just need to get it out of that garage and go somewhere where they can have it safely stored and worked on for a much less cheaper price and have it, uh, you know looked after because it seems like they've just got it in a garage for no reason at the moment Jack de la Mer says it's just been a waste of time yeah it's just been ugh, awkward to watch in a weird way it's like they've got this awesome vehicle and the, if the garage knew like they probably know but they're just not fans if they had someone who owned a garage who was more of a fan who'd be like yeah I'd gladly look after this and that this that and the other then you know I have a feeling that this one, by the way, just going back to the RV uh, concept designs, I have a feeling that this Walter White uh, RV that I'm talking about, this is the one that they used for the Kenner one, right? Because the Kenner, I never owned it, but the Kenner one has this flip down bit at the back, right? So this is the design that Kenner had uh, more than the, more than the, the one seen previously. Okay, now that looks more like the Kenner one. That's an awesome image. So freaking cool. Look at the light coming off the top of the trailer beaming down to the ground. Yeah, I don't know why they haven't just changed garages, but yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I have a feeling they will one day have it restored fully and it will be glorious, but it's just, uh, it just sucks. It's, it's the garage they've got it stored in. Mm. And obviously, as we've all seen in the previous episodes, that thing is a bitch to even get across like the country or move at all. So they, they're options are limited where they can really actually take the RV unless someone has an actual like you know uh, cargo helicopter to help lift it airlift it somewhere uh, <laughs> you know I'm just skipping through some of these pieces of artwork this looks like the glass on the top and you can see some pteranodons fine but yeah some really cool angles. See some of the insides here. And to quote Kelly, so cool. I love that you've got the little cooker there, you've got what well, you got there, a toilet on the left and a few other things. Like Hammond did really plan and a fridge, there's a fridge right in the middle and a dishwasher like they really did have it so this thing could go to Isla Sauna and stay there for a while 
it's almost like the RV is the workers village but uh, on wheels so they had to live there I love that design for the cockpit it just looks like well I say cockpit I mean the cabin of the RV because it looks like a cockpit I think that's so freaking cool so complicated okay so it looks like this is where they would store the camcorders this is very detailed for something that you never see in the film so there's like what camcorders that they shove into the side and then flip it up and then it downloads automatically to the computer is that what it's saying digital camcorder I'm trying to read what that says on DVD is not good. Docking station. <laughs> what is this? Before the internet. This is cool, but I don't like quite know where this would fit in the movie. What was this originally? What is the origin of this? Were they dropping supplies for the engine team, or was this the an original design for where how they got? How, how what was this? Does anyone know why there's a plane, a cargo plane? Oh, I remember this. This is. Uh, how Kelly originally got on the island. She was uh, air, air mailed in. That's Kelly. Kelly's in that box. She's being dropped off on Isla Sauna. <laughs> Dropping off the hunter's jeeps, says Sip Tribes. Yeah, I thought that, but... But wouldn't that damage the cars? Like, just dropping... I guess there's a parachute coming out of the back. But again, the parachute's coming out of the back. And they're flying really low to the trees. It doesn't look like it's going to be a safe landing. Interesting. And here you can see... Uh, I'm going to assume that's meant to be Nick Van Owen. No, it's, I think it's just meant to be like, what if the team actually uh, just lived on the RV? Maybe we can see some concept designs for uh, costumes. The lights, I've, I always forget this, and uh, it always uh, makes me laugh whenever I see it on screen because it, I think it's so cool, but it's something that's overlooked. The two torches on the... Uh, on the shoulders of the hunters. You can see Dieter Stark has them and stuff. He, like when they turn their heads, the lights turn as well. Like the lights actually turn and face wherever they're looking. And I think it's where Stan Winston uh, came up with the Predator gun. You know, the Predator's uh, plasma caster turns and looks wherever the Predator looks. And if you look at the shoulder uh, lights in the Lost World, especially in the scene when they're, you know, Roland's talking to Nick Van Owen about the person who climbed up the top of Mount Everest. You can see whenever they look, the lights turn and look to wherever they're looking. And I always think that's a little detail that just gets overlooked with the uh, with the Lost World. That's really cool and goes to show how uh, InGen's technology was always uh, progressing further. So, like, you could have these automatic torches that just look wherever you look. You know. Uh, it's a little detail that I don't hear too many people talk about. Okay, so this is clearly uh, Ian Malcolm, Sarah Harding, Nick and Eddie Carr. Uh, I'm guess I'm going to say Eddie's the one with the hat on and the green jacket and Nick's the one with the binoculars in his hands. Uh, I'm going to assume that, even though... Yeah, I'm going to say that, because that just looks like the way who it's meant to be. For some costume designs. Mm. Is 
And here we see uh, the hunters. <laughs> Was that the original design of Robert Muldoon? <laughs> no, no. Uh, Roland Tembo, sorry. Roland Tembo. Like a... Looking like a Van Pelt from Jumanji. Come back, you blithering coward. Fight me like a man. <laughs> Big handlebar bar moustache. Could you imagine if Moldine actually looked like that? Oh my god. And is that meant to be... RJ? I don't want to be unintentionally racist here, but is that meant to be RJ? Uh, I don't know who that's meant to be. If only these were in HD, I'd be able to see. Uh, I don't even think they're HD on the Blu-ray. Um, that could be Dieter Stark. And here we see uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Going to take out some dinosaurs. And Isla Sauna. Come on, let's go. Go get some dinosaurs. Come on, Colonel Sanders. Let's do this. And there we go. Holy crap. That was the last one. Okay. Well, that was the illustration and conceptual drawings of The Lost World. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching, looking through all that with me. Um, I think some point in the future I will go to marketing posters and other toys um, but yeah let me let me just whack this up so I can uh, I don't think I can pause that but yeah there you go so I'll just get that up while I go on to the last and final subject for tonight I think uh, did we have one more subject Let's have a little look, looky see. Why haven't we talked about connections to other franchises? That is what. Uh, all right, let me see. Uh, Diego Rossi said, "Do you think that uh, there would be a possible to expand the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World universe in such a way that we could see a cameo with other films and worlds related with Universal's universe?" <clears throat> um. Well, I think a few of you guys know out there that I already consider Twister, the movie Twister, to be part of the Jurassic Park canon. But that's my own personal uh, uh, canon, let's put it that way. Because no actors in Twister are in any of the Jurassic Park films. Uh, the writing of the movie by... Michael Crichton and uh, forget who else worked on the screenplay uh, feels very much like a Jurassic Park film uh, the music aside from the rock music and all that uh, but the the score, the orchestral score sounds like a Jurassic Park movie uh, the whole premise of you know these guys going up against the corporate bad guys like almost in gen uh, going after the tornadoes it just feels so much like a Jurassic Park film. When you watch it, next time you watch Twister, if you imagine uh, the the events in Twister happening just somewhere else in the world after Jurassic Park, in between Jurassic Park and the Lost World, um, yeah, you can... It, it just feels like it works to me. So until something comes along where, like, let's say Bill Paxton is in the next Jurassic Park movie or next Jurassic World movie, uh, then I'll be like, okay, forget it. But until then, Twister, to me, it goes Jurassic Park, Twister, The Lost World, Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World. And, uh, yeah, as someone said, Twister was produced by Kathleen Kennedy, Spielberg, and Michael Crichton. It has that feeling, and um, we homaged it... Uh, on uh, Masrani Global um, 
just as a little joke. Uh, obviously, they have the the machine in Twister is called Dorothy, um, and we were talking about weather satellites and stuff on Masrani Global, and we decided to call one of the weather satellites Glinda, which is named after one of the witches in The Wizard of Oz, like a Dorothy. So if you go to Vazrani Global, you can find that there's like this fun little tie-in. It was my own personal little uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, thing just to make me go, I love Twister. It should be part of the Dress Park canon, but that's my own little uh, gimmick. Uh, but yeah. But yes, so in answer to that question, I think Twister's part of the universe. Uh, what was I going to say? Egyptica says, in Face Off, there's a scene where an InGen logo is seen. Yes, that's because they were shooting. Uh, there's some cargo boxes that have InGen on it. Um, I don't consider Face Off to be part of the Dress Park universe. Uh, it's too ridiculous to be. Um, it's also like they shot a couple of episodes of Sliders in the worker village of the Lost World. Um, but I don't consider Sliders part of the canon. But you, anyone can ask me, do I consider Twister? Yes. That's just me though. I just love Twister, and uh, and I think the, uh, you know, Twister doesn't even get too ridiculous. Uh, I think it, it it just feels like it should be in the same universe, um, and yeah. So there you go. Um, I think next time, guys, we'll need to talk about some other things. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to be doing this again. Uh, probably next week, <laughs> I could imagine. Um, Maybe we should do this next time. Maybe we should go through the toys and other memorabilia uh, for the Lost World. So, like, oh, my God, look at this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, look how hideous that is. Yeah, maybe we should do this next time. We should go through the Lost World posters and, uh, and, and the promotional materials and stuff. Uh, I'll leave it on this. But, yeah, so I... Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed tonight's live stream. I'm I'm semi tipsy. I've been drinking whiskey. Uh, I'm tired because I've been working all day, and uh, yeah, I just love talking Jurassic Park. Does anyone have anything they want to talk about, or anything they want to hear me cover before I leave? Uh, let me know in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't know when I'll next do this. But it should be next week or something. Uh, it's just whenever I'm free and I'm willing to chat Jurassic Park. But what I need you guys to do, actually, uh, or what I would like you guys to do, is send me subjects to talk about. Because that's one thing. Uh, I don't... I want to do these a lot. So I need subjects. And obviously, as all Jurassic Park fans must feel... Um, you know, you exhaust yourself of subjects. So I figured, like, when I did these less chat Jurassic Park, I want people to give me subjects to, like, think about and talk about. Uh, I see Luke Hornsey has said, favourite Jurassic Park toys. Do you know what? I'm going to write that one down because that means on the next chat I can have the Jurassic Park toys out. Um... So let me, I'm literally copying and pasting your question into a notepad so I can remember who said it. Uh, thanks for that one, I actually really like that. It's a quite an obvious one actually, but I've never actually thought to do it on one of these. So thanks for that, man. <laughs> Jurassic Raptor says, favourite brand of whiskey? Well... Uh, that might actually be Jameson's. Uh, I went to the Jameson Brewery in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, uh, the reason I really like Jameson's is uh, they buy wooden barrels from other whiskey companies, other uh, drink companies, and they don't wash them out. This is apparently an inside company secret. They don't wash out the barrels. So when they, you know mature their whiskies in these barrels they get the flavors of whatever was in there before so when you drink jameson's it tastes different to other whiskies because it's got other flavors in there and you know there you go there's your answer i don't even need to do that on the next one jack de la Mer says chatting through these dvd extras is actually really cool 
And cheers, man. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll definitely. I mean, I bought the Jurassic Park three and the Lost World DVDs again recently from Computer Exchange. As you can see, the Lost World was one pound fifty. Would you believe? Um, I do have them obviously on Blu-ray, but uh, to get the live stream to be as smooth as it does because of my internet here and stuff, I have to do it through the DVDs. Uh, so. Uh, I'm limited to that, but I will go through some of these other ones. Um, Queen Jazz asks, totally random question, but what time is it where you are? At the moment, it's 10 to 1 in the morning where I am right now. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty uh, late, but, yeah. And... All right, guys, I think I'm going to go, but... Uh, Egyptica says, do you consider the JP the game canon? All right, I'll finish on this. Uh, I don't personally consider the game canon. Uh, one reason is in the game, the T-Rex smashes through the visitor center doors, but in Jurassic World, obviously the doors are still intact because uh, they open them. Um, and not only that, like I just I just didn't like the story that the game told. I uh, don't think there's a roller coaster on the island, all this sort of stuff. Uh, but Tim, Tim really likes the game. And to compromise, that's why on Masrani Global we named the uh, volcano Cebu. We had the tribe named after it. So basically, uh, with Masrani Global, uh, just for one example, uh, you can consider the game canon if you want because there's connections with what we wrote on the website. But if you don't consider it canon, you can still use the information on the website and it doesn't mean the game is canon. So the mountains called Cebu and the tribe are called the Bribri tribe, or whatever they're called, I can't remember, really remember. But yeah, so I don't consider it canon, but uh, uh, other people do. And Canon is your opinion, that's the thing. To me, Twister is the sequel to Jurassic Park, um, which is a completely separate story, it's a spin-off, but yeah, it's what you want, what you want to happen in a story of a film. Whatever you want is yours make it so anyway all right guys have a good night i hope you've enjoyed uh the live stream uh if you want to find out when the next one is just follow my twitter account uh at jack underscore ewans or at terradome 3000 uh, i usually post in advance when i'm going to do these and you guys can catch up and remember to tweet me subjects you'd like to talk me to talk about or what you guys would like to hear discussed um pfft. Yeah, there you go. All right, guys. I'll catch you on the flip.